So just to reintroduce the panel for anybody who came in later, just uh, has uh, the same short-term memory as me some days. Um, sitting to my right is Yolanda Alindor, Organizational and Professional Development Officer for the San Francisco Foundation. You've just heard from Marla. Sitting next to Marla is Mary Gregory, Senior Program Officer at the Bella Vista Foundation, and Delia Reed, Vice President of Programs for the Meta Fund. Um, and I think after hearing Marla's presentation, we're um, curious to get into, dive right into the development conversation, but we also want an opportunity to um, get to know the panelists a little bit better, particularly in the context of your philanthropic roles in the community. So just give us a general establishing shot of your work. Tell us about your foundation and its overall philanthropic strategies and who is generally able to apply before we get into the capacity building piece. And I think this morning I also want to add a disclaimer to the uh, um, this part of the conversation about applying to these funders because I think... Um, it, this panel in particular was very challenging to recruit for. So first I want to thank the panelists for being able to, to, for being willing to be brave to say, yes, we do fund this and here's the circumstances under which we do fund it. But the disclaimer is I think the reason funders were shy to come out about this is most of them do it within the context of existing grantee portfolios. So it's not something you're generally from the outside able to apply to, although if if that there's idiosyncrasies, we'll hear about them in this presentation. So our hope in assembling this panel was to give you the tools you need to understand which of your donors you might be able to have these kinds of relationships and conversations with where you can evolve an existing donor into somebody who might be willing to support your infrastructure in a larger way. But under no circumstances do I want folks after this panel to then think, oh, I'm going to send letters to these three funders because they all fund this. So that's my disclaimer. And with that said, uh, Yolanda, can you share us a, a little bit about the San Francisco Foundation's general philanthropic sure, approach? Sure, happy to. So the San Francisco Foundation is a community foundation. was established about 60 years ago by wealthy families in San Francisco. Uh, we currently have about 60 people on our staff. In 2012, we gave out about $90 million worth of grants. However, 70 million of that, so certainly the largest portion of it were donor advised funds and of course the donor advised funds are, are done by according to the wishes of the donors pretty much. So then that left us with the, the 20 million which does come from the uh, proceeds from our endowment and those 20 million are granted out by our program staff. We do, um, we do grants in five Bay Area counties, uh, San Mateo, San Francisco, Marin, Contra Costa and Alameda, and in five different areas, arts and culture, community development, community health, education, and the environment. Um, the best way to find out about how that, uh, that work goes is to actually look at their objectives in our um, website, sff.org. Um, and probably the important piece about uh, this type of work, the capacity building work, is the breakdown of our grants in terms of the type of grant making we do. So we, um, we do uh, quite a bit of project-based grants. So over the last three years, so now I'm looking at 2011, 2012, and 2013, we've done um, between 30 to 45 percent of our grants have been project-based. Our capacity building have only ranged into five to six percent, so much smaller. But the big chunk, um, I'm actually very proud to say, is core operating grants. So what's really nice about that is, um, just like any other grants, of course, we, um, the, you, you would be working with uh, one of our program officers to determine the outcomes for the grants. But the funds are available with flexibility. You can use the funds whatever way you need to and deem as important as, um, as in, within your own organizations. We're just looking that you get to the outcomes. So, um, so I'm really proud about that, that core operating piece because that's really the best way to get some of your um, infrastructure work done, so some of the capacity building work done. Um, we do usually one responsive grant cycle a year. So, um, so it is during that time period where our, um, where our doors are open to receive ap grant applications from any nonprofit that feels that they meet um, our criteria. And as I said, the criteria is listed by program area in our, on our website. So that's probably a good overview. 
Great, thanks Yolanda. And Mary, how about at the Bella Vista Foundation? So I am a, actually executive director of the Bella Vista Foundation, which is a was started in 1999 and is a private family foundation. Uh, it has two program areas, ecosystem restoration, and one that we have been calling early childhood, but which is now called infants and families connecting. And that's the one I'll talk uh, about in a major way, although I think Annie Yates in her ecosystem restoration work has also done capacity building because a lot of what we do there, this isn't a huge foundation, we have about a million two in each of the two program areas to spend. Annie in five watersheds in California and Oregon and me in four counties, Marin, San Francisco, San Mateo, and Santa Clara. So it's not a lot of money when you have, uh, even though we have a very specific role to play um, in our work. And so what Annie has done in ecosystem is to really foster collaborative efforts in these watersheds that include forest restoration, um, fish habitats, working with farmers and environmentalists together to on common goals, that kind of thing. And so she's ended up doing some technical assistance, I would say sort of by default, because that was what was needed to get these, these efforts rolling. And I have uh, ended up doing uh, some in the, in the course of grant making, which I'll talk about a little bit later, but really what the foundation, the, the uh, Infants and Families Connecting, is focused on uh, low-income families with children prenatal to three uh, who are at risk for anxiety or mood disorders or depression because of the effect that that has on healthy attachment of infants to parents and caregivers. So it's very, very specific. Um, and, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about how the, the uh, technical assistance plays out in that. And who is eligible to apply, or is it by invitation only? No, it's, it's an open process, but there are very few organizations that actually are that specific. Right. So we don't get, uh, and we tend to fund over time. So um, we have one new grantee actually in the audience, but that, uh, who came through technical assistance? So that's an interesting story <laughs> that I will tell. But uh, uh, for the most part, we don't get too many random applications just because not too many so people are working on this um, with that intensity and with the scientific background in mind. Got it. Thanks, Mary. And Delia. Um, well, MetaFund is a health conversion foundation. It was formed also in 1999 from the sale of Davies Medical Center to Sutter and CPMC. Our offices are currently located in Corte Madera, but next year we'll be moving back into Washington, D.C. We'll have a building that fortunately the first floor will have community conference and convening space. We're looking at what type of additional technical assistance and training we can provide. So this is really mm -hmm. timely. Um, currently, our grant making strategy is uh, we restructured it. Our mission is quite broad. It's to improve health in San Francisco. For a while, we had been funding in particular health issue areas, but our board really wanted our funding to be reflective of the demographics of the entire city and also in terms of its geography. So we spent a lot of time trying to figure out how can we be funding at all of those different levels, different neighborhoods, et cetera. So we took our overall grant making budget and we divided it into six different types of grant support that can be provided. Um, and with that, really thinking that we would be able to cover the demographics and the geography of the city. So we work a lot with UCSF and the Department of Public Health. So we have a pool of funding called our Institutional Partner Grants that allows us to work with some of those larger institutions. We then have, um, I was able to advocate uh, for, I guess, about three years to our board to be able to provide general operating support grants, and that was approved uh, February of last year. So 30% of our grant making budget is now for general operating support. That's for organizations with budgets less than five million. And it's a, um, it's a tiered funding, so it's grants of 25, um, 
25,000 for organizations with budgets under 500,000, then it's uh, 50,000 for budgets of 500,000 to 2 million, and 75,000 for um, organizations with budgets between 2 million and 5 million. And that's been great. So we're just starting to see some of the final reports uh, from those grants, and I can talk more about that. We also provide uh, healthy neighborhood grants for our work with the Beacons and the YMCAs or organizations that are working at a neighborhood level. Um, and then uh, impact grants, which are multi-year commitments uh, for organizations that are a little bit more sophisticated in their use of data and having the data be able to um, really uh, indicate the, the impact that organizations are having and using that data to monitor their progress and be able to report back on their outcomes. And then the final area is um, financial aid for financially disadvantaged youth in San Francisco to attend summer camps. So it's, it's nice when I think about our grant making, if I think about every little corner of the city that is probably working to improve health, we're probably able to um, provide funding in that way. Um, we are really small, and we work really closely with our grantees, so we fund by invitation only. We have about 100 active grantees right now. But I will say that we encourage anybody who takes a look at our information and thinks that they are a good fit to get in touch with us, um, to send in a concept letter and a corresponding project budget. We have a very long due diligence and research process before we even pick up the phone to learn more from the executive director. But it's, um, it is a close relationship even during that period. Thanks, Delia. Um, next, we're going to segue to um, having more of a close-up on the report. So given the underdeveloped presentation we just heard and our focus here today to learn more about development-related capacity building, uh, please tell us how capacity building plays a role in your grant-making strategy or go more in-depth if you just gave broad strokes a minute ago. Uh, and what kinds of investments you've made specific to bolstering the development uh, capacity of your grantees. And I think something that we all struggle with on the development side, since traditionally donors prefer to fund programs, uh, let us know how you came around to incorporating this kind of support into your portfolios. Um, I was heartened to hear some of you are carving out dollars specific to general operating, which may be the strategy. So um, Delia, we'll stick with you and come back down this sure. way. Well, it, it was um, a difficult process to get our board uh, first to understand the importance of core support or general operating support. And I think that, and we hear this a lot, that um, funders are much more comfortable funding program support. And I think the reason why is that foundation boards are just like nonprofit boards. They are um, they're carrying a lot of information in their heads. They're pretty, um, you know, very involved, but maybe overcommitted. And um, for foundation boards, I think that it's easier for them to wrap their hands around uh, program support. So if somebody says, oh, what are you funding? They can say, oh, you know, the expansion of this program or a staff person for this program. And um, similarly, when they look to the outcomes of that investment, it's much more quantifiable. I think with the general operating support, it's, um, it's, it's wonderfully easy to say, you know, we support these 17 different organizations with these grants, but when the board really wants to know, well, what is the impact, you know, what, what is the return on our investment, it's a little bit more amorphous for them. And we really arrived at this type of funding because we had one side of the board, which is our numbers and metrics folks, and they really wanted to know what the return on our investment was. And then we, we had another side of our board who said, we want to be able to continue to provide much needed support for the organizations that are on the ground providing essential services, especially in this economic climate. And so that's, that was sort of the opening door to be able to do the general operating support. Um, interestingly, I will say though that in the, the grant application process with the general operating support grants, we asked them to self-select how these funds would be used. And I think we have 
maybe 13 or 14 different categories. And um, so many of them, I would say the majority, chose uh, core support um, and board development. <clears throat> and actually, even though we had fund development there, um, or fundraising, um, I would say maybe just three or four organizations singled that out as that's what the funds would be used for. And in reading this report and thinking about our work in this area, <coughs> excuse me, I think that um, there is a problem in the field that the fund development and the development staff is sort of seen as an appendage to the organization. Like it's it's so vital, but it's if you're talking about the you know, the program and the services that are being offered to transitional aged youth, you have a really clear understanding of that and how the organization is structured, but it's like the development, you know, the blood for that is sort of kept off to the side. And so going forward, I think we'll be much more um, upfront with the organizations about uh, designating funding to that. And then I'll, I'll just say one other point. One of the reasons that this was so important to us is because in our due diligence, we do a pretty high-level financial review. <clears throat> and we have four different financial ratios that, that we, um, we look at and we develop that information. So we do look at cash flow, cash on hand, and we actually um, give green, yellow, and red <laughs> coding to where <laughs> the organizations fall into their <laughs> into their ratios. And cash on hand is just a critical issue, as I'm sure all of you all know. And so is reliance on, on government funding. Um, and those, again, speak directly to the importance of having the development staff be really on board with what the financial goals are for the, the organization and the processes to get there. So I think maybe our applicants were nervous of saying this is for fundraising directly, or maybe they were taking the core support and it was trickling down. But I would be much more interested going forward and being much more um, explicit about that. Thanks, Delia. And Mary, how about at Bella Vista? Well, I'm lucky to have a board that has been very involved in the nonprofit world themselves as board members and, and participants in uh, county efforts and so they really understand the importance of of core support and like Yolanda our grant letter actually says the program we're most interested in is X but this should be considered um, uh, unrestricted funding so it means that technically organizations if they got more funding for the program we're interested in and that was safe could put it towards technical assistance, although I've never really asked that question. Mm -hmm. We have, we, I'm a believer having been on the nonprofit side of technical assistance in tech, and so what we've done as a foundation is to hold convenings for either subsets of our grantees or all of our grantees, sometimes reaching beyond our grantees to other organizations that we know that are active in this, uh, in our fields. And we've done uh, both content technical assistance, more about depression and mood disorders and why that's important, um, how to recognize depression and then what to do about it for staff of programs. But we've also um, <laughs> done some technical assistance most recently because we're making a push towards more and better data for program self-improvement to, uh, we've been working with a consultant who does a lot of work around theories of change. And that's how Ali found us, or, or we started a conversation, and actually the first grant, which is very unusual, that his organization got was to, uh, um, after having participated in our convening, was a small grant to do one-on-one -on -one work with his organization around theory of change. And so uh, that's a relatively new strategy for us to do sort of one-on-one -on -one work with organizations. You know, mini grants can go a long way to, uh, to helping. It doesn't have to be a big amount of money often in technical assistance. And, uh, but I've come to the conclusion over the years that 
not just uh, grants with the word development in them are development technical assistance. I think all technical assistance actually comes, uh, impro ideally, improves an organization's uh, ability to tell their story, improves their strength as an organization. And so um, I, I think, think that's a really important point, especially related to your theory of change, yes. because yeah. a lot of applications now ask for that. And guess who ends up creating one if there's not one that exists? How many <laughs> development directors in the room have, you know, after hours been creating a theory of change for their organization, right? So what you're providing is a way for it to be built into the program. That's right. And, and we've also funded branding and marketing. So we've helped uh, two organizations kind of rebrand themselves. And I was a little skeptical on one of them, which is pretty weak in the development area. But what it did was to bring people together to talk about the mission of the organization. And it actually did strengthen their ability to do fundraising. They still need some more of the technical know-how. But I think it is it was helpful for them. Um, the other one ran with it. Um, and we're, they're not even a grantee anymore. This was kind of an exit strategy for us with hand-in-hand -hand parenting, which used to be Parent Leadership Institute in Palo Alto. And they uh, rebranded, uh, really upped their technical presence, so now they have a very robust program online. Uh, and they ran with it and have just uh, immeasurably broadened the reach of the organization, strengthened its materials. Um, they've really run with it. It's, it's a great story. It's one of my proudest uh, relationships with a grantee because of what they were able to do. So, uh, in And certainly sort of saying, those materials play a big role in their development. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And their, and their reach both online and in the community has expanded a lot. So that has give them, given them more access to people who know about them, who can support them. Um, and, and beyond. So I think that's really exciting. I think uh, from a funder's point of view, sometimes you don't get exactly what you think you're going to get out of a technical assistance <laughs> grant. And I go back to my friend uh, Joan Libman, who used to run the If Not Now When, the INNW Fund. Um, she used to talk about they did only technical assistance for small environmental education programs. And Joan said at one point, an, a, a, an a agency came to her and said, we really need a video about our agency so we can take it out and show people, and then they'll give us money. And she dug a little deeper and talked to people and decided, no, really what you need is a course to teach your board members how to make the ask. Because you can show any number of great, beautiful videos, and if nobody follows it up properly, you're not going to get anywhere. Mm -hmm. So I think that in doing technical assistance grant making, there is there's some subtlety that needs to go into it to help organizations really figure out what is the next step in the development process and, and what do they need to ramp up, what skills do they need to ramp up. So OK, thanks, Mary and Yolanda. Um, so, as a community foundation, the San Francisco Foundation is um, very interested in the overall sort of health and strength of the nonprofit infrastructure in the areas where we work. So that leads us to some extent uh, naturally to the area of capacity building, because if you want to address a particular issue, and in that place where you want to address it, let's pick on something everybody knows about, um, gun violence in Oakland and Richmond, <laughs> for starters. Um, if there's not, if, and if you want to, to use the nonprofit sector as a way to address that issue, if you don't have strong, stable, big enough, powerful enough, effective nonprofits working in that area, well-connected, credible nonprofits working in that area, there's no place to invest our funds. So the strength of the, of the sector as a whole is really important to us, um, and, in, and certainly on an issue by issue and geography by geography basis. Um, we find um, 
this is probably more my interpretation than necessarily that of the San Francisco Foundation. But I find that, um, that there's some tensions over time, um, particularly as the philanthropic world has, fa has uh, moved more and more towards a metric-based, theory of change-based, um, impact-seeking um, sort of orientation, and there's been enormous changes in that, moving in that direction over the last, um, I don't know, 10 years at least, I would say, um, that, um, that then it's hard to make these arguments for things like strengthening the sector, sector and capacity building because they are so hard to measure and they're such long-term um, investments. So, um, you know, so we saw the slide about the five years to build up in one organization, the, the culture and the infrastructure and so forth. And I would say, you know, that's, that's going at a pretty good clip. <laughs> and it really is. Um, and so, so it's, um, it, it makes it difficult for, uh, for grant makers to, um, to make that case on an ongoing basis and to be able to show um, to show the progress in a, in a meaningful way. You know, the fact that somebody, that an organization or even a group of organizations now has the software to be able to maintain relationships doesn't make, um, doesn't cut it as, as well as, you know, you've reached so many more, hundreds more people or you've passed a public policy um, legislation. So it's, it's a tough case to make. And that's actually a great segue to the next question, which is uh, partially about outcomes, but also just about how development capacity building can vary greatly, as Mary was just talking about. It can look like uh, helping an organization hire its first development director and get its development department in order, or um, funding uh, the installation and uh, training around a fundraising database, uh, or perhaps even an evaluation consultant so that people organizations can talk about outcomes with their donors. So what have you learned from the investments you've been making about the kinds of interventions that are most effective, particularly given the scope of a typical grant cycle, which is 12 to 24 months, where then the organization has to have something to show for what the investment has yielded? Um, and what kinds of outcomes did you expect in those kinds of grants that you thought were most effective? And um, Mary, I think I'll pick on you for since you've cited a few of those already. Well, I think you have to be very patient as a funder because it just doesn't happen quickly. And uh, I think of one organization in Marin and we did some branding and then we did some succession planning and that actually got a little bit closer to the real development outcomes that I was hoping for because the uh, executive director realized her successor was going to be, f because of the drop in government funding, was really going to have to step up to the plate in a way that she hadn't in all her years with the organization when 80% of it was funded by government. So it changed the job description. So it changed the job description. So that was an interesting wrinkle. But I think that really comes, um, as Delia was saying, from our longtime association with these grantees. You, as a funder, you have to build up a certain amount of trust. You have to know where the organization's strengths and weaknesses are. I think it's the most um, rewarding kind of grant making because you have that level of, of uh, knowledge of the organization and its people. Uh, but you can't expect overnight miracles. And that means that in a typical grant cycle, not much may have happened. And uh, you and I'm again. I'm lucky to have a board that understands that. That's not not looking for such strict metric, metrics that they're going to say, "Well, that didn't work. So let's go on. Let's move away from this or organization." Or and so, do I recall correctly that you mentioned making this kind of investment as well as part of an exit strategy? Yeah. Um, once in a while, I think it's a nice way to especially if you've been funding for seven eight, or eight years, to be able to say, we're going to step down, but in the course of that stepping down, is there something that would be useful to you in uh, building your capacity to keep this program going? 
and that might well pertain to development so in some way. So that takes the pressure off the outcomes because you've right. already told them you're exiting. Right. And so for those in the room, it might plant an interesting seed of an idea for if a funder does call you and say, I'm giving you fair warning, next year will probably be your last grant. This might be a good time to have that kind mm -hmm. of conversation. Yep, definitely. Um, and Yolanda, see you nodding your head, so you want to <laughs> jump in next? Yeah, I want to talk a little bit about sort of the different ways in which we do capacity building. So I did mention the um, our open grant cycle where um, it's actually about $7 million recently. Uh, in recent years of our $20 million it goes to the open responsive and then you can go for um, core operating and that's one way to do capacity building. But another way out of the remaining $13 million, which goes to um, initiatives that we, or other projects that we, that are not open, that are by invitation only, um, that we've done a variety of different kinds of capacity building. As I've been thinking about what we've done in the seven years that I've been at the foundation, um, we've done three different programs. No, we've done two different programs for um, that were arts and culture oriented that provided workshops on, on marketing, on building audiences, on changing demographics in audiences in different ways of, of getting funding, uh, and also individual donor kind of work. We've, um, we've done a nonprofit transitions fund, which was in, uh, intended for um, to address the economic recession and to help uh, organizations sort of move or change the way in which they functioned. And so a lot of that, a good chunk of that had to do with like back office collaborations, which have been shown to be quite effective. Um, then uh, we've done two other um, that are strictly capacity building. One um, was the Strength uh, from Within program, which was uh, for environmental environment and, and uh, health and justice organizations it was largely funded by our partners at, oh my God, I just blanked out on it. It'll come to me. There was another big foundation that, uh, that funded a lot of that project. And then we put in some funding as well. It was a three-year project for about 10 organizations. Um, that was very much by um, organizations that we've known and worked with for a long time from either our environment or community health program. And then um, we also did a, um, we were also an intermediary for the community leadership project that was funded by Hewlett, Irvine, and Packard. Um, Hewlett, Irvine, and Packard is still on this path. They've funded a second round, which we're not involved with, but um, I believe the grants are going out for those at this point in time, and I'm pretty sure that here in the Bay Area, those were an open uh, process as well. But in our community leadership project that, um, I, that I ran for the San Francisco Foundation portion, we had between 10 and 12 grantees for a three-year project where we provided funding for the organization to do their own capacity building in um, based on a plan that they did at the beginning, an assessment and a plan, and then they implemented it. And, and then there was um, quarterly uh, training workshops that were based on a very heavily negotiated curriculum of what they and wanted. The, and this was targeting um, grants for organizations that were working in communities of color led by a person of color, is that correct? Am I remembering the, correctly? Yes, the Hewlett, Irvine, and Packard uh, earmarked the funding for low-income communities and communities of color, and we actually smushed them both together, so we funded organizations that were um, working in low-income communities of color and were led by people of color so as to build the strength within those communities. So, um, so that was a three-year program, and the we did. As I looked back on it, and it um, preparing for this, we did a lot of those group activities, cohort activities, in some area of fundraising. So we met with the um, the program officers from Hewlett and Packard. We had the the organizations do uh, proposal histories. So, you know, who they had submitted proposals to, what the um, results of those were, whether they did them individually or collect or as part of a collaboration. Um, and then we shared that information across all the organizations so they could see who was funding these sort of social justice. Uh, most of them had a strong social justice bent to them. Um, we did, um, we had uh, panels of successful uh, fundraisers, both consultants and EDs who had who had run similar kinds of organizations. We did an earned income panel. We did a panel on program officers of color. We did um, 
a briefing. Um, we actually, the San Francisco Foundation co-hosted a briefing that was um, put on by the uh, Northern California grant makers, wherein we featured um, a fair number of our grantees from both the Strengths From Within program and the Community Leadership Project um, that are involved with an organization called San Francisco Rising, a, a, a sort of advocacy organization. So there was a, uh, an enormous, there, I counted like nine different things that we did over this three year period, and we only met quarterly, so nine was quite a few of them <laughs> that and were I based on fundraising. And I guess that activity was unique because it was initiative based from yes. the CLP, so you had a specific period of time that you were aiming to do all of those activities. So I guess an important takeaway is that you mentioned the next phase of this is now under um, development or, or about to launch with the um, new uh, um, uh, partners that are, yes. and I know Community Foundation, or Silicon Valley Community Foundation one is one, and it's Horizons? No, no. it's um, Tim Little at the Rose Foundation. Oh, Rose Foundation. So the Rose Foundation and, um, and Silicon Valley are currently doing the grant making. They should be about done with their decisions, would be my guess, based on the original timelines um, for the Bay Area. But if people want to learn more, that those would be the two entities yes. to check with for the next phase of the work. Right. Um, and in all of those, that list of things, were there any that jumped out at you? Or maybe it's too soon to tell since it's fairly <laughs> recent from what we've been yes, hearing. Right. But were any of the investments particularly um, effective in terms of the results that they generated? Or is it too soon to tell? Well, I'm going to tell a story that was most mm -hmm. striking to me, um, which is that when we met with the funders from Hewlett and Packard, um, the grantees, we did a very elaborate process where they wrote one pagers in advance and, and then they got feedback and then we met in small groups so they'd have time, they'd have an opportunity to talk to each other and then we had a full group discussion and they came up with all those discussion questions. It was very processy, but you know, they got what they wanted out of it. The afternoon we debriefed and one of the sort of big ahas from that group of EDs was these funders, at least as from what we heard, from the program officers who were present don't understand our work and have a completely different world view than what we have. So, um, so it, it was really a big sort of um, reckoning. Um, interestingly enough, um, I think most of what, what our, I'm talking to our evaluation team because we, the big CLP, Hewlett Irvine um, Packard, hired an evaluation firm to do the whole project because it's Bay Area and Central Coast and Central Valley, it's huge. We decided to do an evaluation of just our little piece because we knew we were doing it in a, in a particular way and we were interested in finding out what worked. So our evaluation team is telling me that, um, that one of the patterns they're beginning to see across the uh, organizations is that many of them have invested more in um, in processes and structures to do individual donor um, development. Mm -hmm. So um, so I think there was an awakening <laughs> about, you know, what can we expect from these mainstream funders versus what do we need to do to build up our own communities and our own support. And that kind of mirrors, I think, what we at the Center and Pi Compass Point have been telling people for years is that you can't live on foundation grants alone. So, you know, in fact, the majority of funding comes from individual yes. donors. So did, um, was that type of probing anything you did in your research, like it, looking at foundation support versus individual support, Marla? Um, we did ask, oh, thank you, we did ask um, what revenue streams mm -hmm. uh, the respondents' organizations uh, had, and you know, it, it and were those that were more foundation reliant the revolving door? <laughs> yeah, you know, um, it's a great question. Um, you know, it really was across the board, which is interesting. And, and the the data footed pretty well with, um, you know, the the uh, the Giving USA data and other data that's produced out there. So, uh, you know, we were pre pretty well aligned in mm -hmm. terms of that. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. So, I think the other. Um, uh, headline we're hearing from this panel is just what we all know already, and that's that the competition for these kinds of dollars is very fierce. Uh, and probably among the different types of support you can get, this type of support is the toughest. Um, so what advice would you give the nonprofits attending this program about how to make the most compelling case to their donors for this kind of support? 
Uh, and also along these lines, some might be worried that in these conversations, they might be revealing internal weaknesses that may actually hurt their chances of ultimately getting uh, their next big grant. So how can one make the case without stigmatizing the organization? And finally, do you agree that this is likely funding that will stem from those already supporting the organization? Um, and I think Delia will start with you and come back this way. Well, our, um, I think as Yolanda, maybe you said that we can't do our work without you and without nonprofit partners. Um, and it really is a relationship, and it's a complicated and wonderful relationship. And you, you end up learning a lot about each other. And I think one of the most important things to learn is to be candid. And um, I remember there seemed to be a point, sort of a transformation in the field where grantees or applicants would push back quite hard against us saying, you know, no, I'm sorry, we're not able to fund you, or we have to make cuts. And at first, I was a, a little bit uh, taken back by that. But it, you realize that it's just as important for them to make their case and um, to find out the reasons for your rationale and all of your internal thinkings as it is for foundations to know about the things that they are facing internally. And so I think with this type of a grant request, or, or if you're thinking about talking to a funder about this, what I would suggest is you could say to them, you funded us to do this previously. Uh, we were successful as we've reported. What we want to be able to do is to be able to increase our efficiencies in this area or expand a program in this area. In order to do so, we really need support for the fund development or the development staff. And I think just be very clear about what it is they're funding and what that will, will gain in the end. And as I said earlier, I think that, I mean, definitely we haven't been our mindset has not been to fund development directly. Um, we offer a huge amount of counsel and advice to our grantees about other funders that um, they might be a good fit with, and we help broker um, that introduction, and um, I helped set up the Bay Area Health Funders Network as a result because I think it's just as important that funders are talking to each other about what they're funding and perhaps can be more aligned in their strategies so that organizations aren't having to constantly jump through hoops and reinvent themselves to get that funding. So I think that that is really important. I think the two other things that have been touched on is the um, the board development, as I said, we're seeing a lot of that, and it is really to be able to go after more of the high net worth individuals um, and to develop the board so that they are um, bringing on um, individuals that are able to give, but also to be able to make the ask uh, to individuals. We're also seeing um, a need for funding communication so that organizations are able to take all of their information and massage it in a way that they are able to succinctly talk and present their outcomes to potential donors. Um, so I think that is a trick and it's also getting towards the, this drive for metrics and outcomes. And then finally, um, we've been seeing um, requests and we've been funding business managers. I think that there's this dialogue in the sector as well about um, just the issues and challenges around how the social sector is financed in general. And so we're seeing nonprofits ask for funding for business managers so that they can make sure that they are uh, internally set up so that they are able to run like a profitable business and also doing an analysis of possible earned income revenue streams to incorporate those into their work. So I think you can, I would just encourage you to be very honest with the funder. We're going to find any red flags regardless if we are doing our jobs. It's better to have it out there on the table and a reason why it exists. So I, I think we need to be as honest with each other as possible. Thanks, Delia. And Mary, advice? Yeah. I, would, I would second a lot of that. We probably know what some of those weaknesses are anyway. 
Um, and especially if you have a long-term relationship with a funder, it's a great conversation to have. Uh, I wouldn't, I was recalling a comment made to me by a dear friend who recently died, who was the head of a nonprofit here in San Francisco for many years and never known for her tact. She was <laughs> uh, a fantastic advocate. But she said to me one day, Mary, the people who run foundations are the least qualified to give money away. And that stung, but I understood <laughs> what she was saying, which is that, uh, and it's one of the reasons I won't hire anybody for Pacific Foundation Services, we manage 20 foundations, who hasn't had significant nonprofit experience, pref preferably development experience, because it's a really, really hard job. However much support you have, however evolved your organization, it's difficult. And so um, uh, I think back to her when I, when I think about this, but I also, I think those relationships are really the key. The long-term relationships with funders, be they individuals or foundations, because I, I think you shouldn't overlook the possibility that it's a, it might be an effective way to move a major donor to a higher level to say, you've been a great friend of ours, you've been giving uh, us you know, nice grants for X number of years, this is what we really need right now, would you consider it? And often these are very, um, even though they may take a while to show results, they're very concrete projects. They're the kind of thing individuals often like because it's, it's well-defined, it's, it's able to be described. So, um, so I think that's another option that shouldn't be overlooked, but um, I think your best chance for technical assistance is probably with the foundations that you've had the longest relationships with. Thanks, Mary. Uh, Yolanda? Absolutely. Um, it's always about the relationships, and it's also, I think, helping to connect the dots, which is a lot of what I'm hearing um, from my colleagues. Um, don't necessarily expect that um, that that the person reading the proposal and trying to make the case will see the connection between your fund development work and what and your vision. Uh, so you need to really make that connection clear. And I sort of think about um, I sort of think that a um, that a lot of foundation people are humans too, and um, <laughs> and we we like to be sold on the vision. We want to get passionate along with you. At least at the San Francisco Foundation, all of our program staff has had work in the field in which they're doing grant making. They may not have been development directors, but they did do work in that arena. So they get passionate and excited about your vision. So you could sell your capacity building as this is the vision. We're doing all this great work right now, but this is the vision for where we want to go. And to help us get there, we need this, the resources, and we need this, this, and this in our, in our um, fundraising system to be able to accomplish our vision every bit as much as we need skilled staff and technology in those pieces to, to deliver the program that we, that we want to do for our community, for our society, for our issue. So then the conversation is less about weaknesses and more about scaling the organization and how you... Or a new area. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and how you evolve. Evolve. Now, I have one more uh, suggestion. We have funded not either or, but we've funded and. Okay. So we've had several times when organizations have come to us and said, will you give us slightly less for our program, but would you add on a chunk for strategic planning? Because that's what we really need right now, and, and often the board's willing to consider that. Um, I was just going to add another thing that we've been doing is funding collaboratives, and I know that collaboratives are, are hard work. One of the reasons that we are doing that, especially working in health in San Francisco, is that there are so many different organizations, and as I said, we only fund 100, and I think there are over 3,000 health nonprofits in the city. So for us to be able to leverage our funding, we're looking for natural collaboratives that we can perhaps provide funding for the lead agency then to do technical assistance below. And an example with that is with the Parks Alliance. We provided funding for the Parks Alliance to um, do technical assistance, and it can be in fund development or any area for all of the different urban agriculture initiatives that are popping up in the city and 
um, many of which they're serving as the fiscal agent for. We're also doing that with the San Francisco Health Improvement Partnership, which is a partnership between UCSF and community-based organizations for them to learn from each other how best to have impact at the community level in health. And so we were able to provide the funding to UCSF, which will be passed through. So I think that um, my, my thing is that if you did want to approach a funder with other similar organizations or that, uh, other entities that have similar goals is to make sure that the funder mm -hmm. provides that support for funding the collaborative, all the operating costs that are needed with that so they're not just funding, again, the program. Thanks, Delia. Mm -hmm. um, and now, Marla, I want to weave you back in because I think we've just heard a very um, uh, helpful insights from the funders about kind of their perspectives on this issue. And, you know, you've been gathering funder insights now for a while since being on the road when this report hit in yeah. January. And I know most recently the Grantmakers for Effective Organizations had a webinar that was solely a funder conversation. And I think there's been other funder conversations you've been involved with since then. So what, uh, what, what are you hearing nationally that might signal any changes or just insights on how to weave this into the conversation with donors? Yeah, let me um, say a little bit about the webinar series itself. So we weren't sure that we were going to do, well, we didn't, after the report was out, we weren't sure we would do anything else necessarily on that. I mean, it certainly influences our own work at Compass Point, but we weren't necessarily seeing a project that would follow on. But after um, having a lot of these conversations, the Haas Jr. Fund and, and us at Compass Point, we decided to go ahead and continue the con well, start the conversation, continue the conversation through these three uh, webinars as a series. And they just concluded, uh, the last one was two, a week and a half ago. So the first one was, so what about all of this information? What are we going to do about it? And the first one was for nonprofit leaders. So execs and development directors pr pr predominantly. And we had about 100 or so folks on that webinar from across the country talking about what really specific on the ground tangible action items could come out of this. So then we rolled that into the second one. And that second uh, uh, webinar was with capacity builders. So people like me at Compass Point and other consultants, search consultants are a huge part of this conversation around development directors. There's a lot of search going on with development. Um, other organizations that are part of the infrastructure of, of supporting nonprofits, so providing the capacity building and the technical assistance that uh, we're all talking about. And uh, the third one, as Janet said, just concluded last Monday, which was just for funders. And so it was an opportunity for them to say, okay, given what our grantees are saying and needing, given what our capacity building partners are doing, uh, what do we do need to do in terms of our own practice? And um, the thing that I was excited about is we, we continued this sort of theme, if you will, or I don't know, maybe sort of organizing principle of holding the mirror up. And you heard me say that earlier. And the other uh, thing I was saying is we got to interrogate our own practices around this. And so holding the mirror up, meaning what are we doing? Um, and what do we need to do differently? And, but also the intersection of these three groups, which haven't always talked about these issues together. And, um, and that intersection is so important. So all of that to say, what we're going to do next is put out an action guide that we'll make available for free to everybody um, that I haven't even started writing. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> but um, will be out at the, before the end of this fall, I think, um, where it is very much going to be informed by not just from Compass Point and the Haas Junior Fund, but everything we've heard from you and the, the broad you. So I just want to make sure I said that, that that's coming. Look for it. Um, hopefully it'll resonate for you. Um, and then to add to what my, my colleagues up here in, in the panel have already said, I mean, I think some of the things that I really heard were readiness about before making an investment, a capacity building investment, what's it going towards? So talking about, you, Mary, you said, you know, it might be that you really need to invest first in strategy definition before making a grant for um, uh, fundraising or, or what have you, and, and really getting at these success, fa these success factors that we're talking about. So that was a theme I really heard in this last webinar um, uh, two weeks ago, which is, 
if we're going to invest in fund development capacity, we need to really shift our perspective and realize that what it is is actually investing in creating a culture of philanthropy and all that that means. And so that could be infrastructure development, that could be engagement on the board, that could be a, a donor database. Uh, it could be a number of things. It also might be a development director position. Um, but some of the things I thought were really interesting too that um, I was uh, glad to hear because it felt like a nice frank conversation. Um, a few funders said things like, you know, we've often been disappointed when we've made a grant to a, a, a grantee um, for a development director position, the search and then ultimately the hire, because um, it didn't work out and then they were gone. And so we had this great conversation about, well, what are you actually buying with that grant? Are you buying the search process? Well, the search process was successful. I mean, the search was. Um, but then the person got in the role, right? And then what are you buying and what are you expecting from that? Are you, you know, what are you, are you expecting them to stay for how long? And can you really reasonably expect that? So then we had this good conversation about, well, what if the person left prematurely, but the organization was in a much better place after he or she had been there. Isn't that still success? So that really turned into another a whole good conversation around how do we define um, success metrics in capacity building around fund development and can you really hinge it to the person, the DD, or is it really about these organizational infrastructure systems and those kinds of things um, and how do we kind of uh, shift our, our expectations around that earlier on so that we're not halfway through the grant and then saying, uh-oh, what's going on here? And that's where the, the last thing I'll say um, that I also thought was, it was really helpful to come out of this is as we're talking about capacity building and found funders investing, making capacity building grants to nonprofits, there's often an intermediary that is part of that equation. The intermedi intermediary being somebody like me from Compass Point or another uh, great consultant who comes in and writes that development plan or works with that executive director or does board development or sets up that database or what have you. Um, and so to the extent to which the funder and the capacity builder have to really be on the same page about success metrics, what is reasonable expectations, and what we saw sometimes is another one of these kind of like whoops moments where um, there were unreasonable expectations perhaps on the part, um, not you know maliciously so, but just for lack of information on the part of perhaps the funder uh, because of these arbitrary grant cycles that we're all living in, right? It's like, oh, it has to be done in 12 months because that's the cycle, right? And you, you all talked about that. Um, and uh, so therefore, I want to see success in 12 months. Um, and, then, and then the holding the mirror up to ourselves is how often do we as consultants say, okay, I can deliver that plan in 12 months then for, for my client and for your grantee. So we're colluding a lot on some of these issues. And so um, the excitement that I think really came out of that is more honesty and candor and being really frank with one another about what's reasonable uh, to expect and, and, and how to kind of shift our perspective away from fund development per se, that, yes, that's important, but also just about organizational capacity and culture broadly speaking. Well, thanks, Marla. Um, I'd like to let you in on the conversation now. We'll be opening it up for questions and the usual ground rules apply. Just remember this is a pitch-free zone and we want your question to be generally of interest to everybody in the room. If you have something that requires a lot of detail, come up afterward and speak with the panelists individually. Let us know if your question is for an individual on the panel or the panel as a whole, and please try to keep yourself to one question at least initially so we can get to as many of you as possible. And uh, you can race up here to the top in the uh -oh. first one here. <laughs> <laughs> Troy, you have a built-in advantage. <laughs> I have a, a very straightforward question from Marla. Um, and some, Troy, you can say your name and order. I'm Troy Arnold. I'm with the Justice and Diversity Center of the Bar Association of San Francisco. I'm the development director there. And Marla, I'm aware, and, and perhaps people in the audience may or may not be, that there was another study similar to this around executive directors. And I'm really interested to know what Compass Point is doing to try and get these two studies to talk to each other and if there's, if there's where that conversation is and, and what we can expect on that in the future, if there is stuff. Are you referring to the Daring to Lead? Yes. OK. Great uh, question. Thanks, Troy. Yeah, uh, great question and great idea, actually, too. Um, you know, there are definitely some through lines, I would say, in the Daring to Lead. For those of you who aren't familiar with Daring to Lead, um, 
it's a study, we've done it three times every five years. The last one was out in 2011, so during to late 2011. It's a study of executive directorship. Uh, um, and one of the themes that has come out of Daring to Lead consistently has been executive directors' frustration and, and significant challenges around fundraising. And I think there's a, there's a place that is very much um, uh, a connection point between this study and the other. And when we do this action guide, I think that's really the opportunity for us to say, let's not just look at underdeveloped, this study we're talking about right now, but let's pull back and actually look at all the data we have and others have. Um, and it's, it's something that, we, you know, we are not at all interested in being proprietary about. What we're really interested in doing is trying to help ourselves and you answer these questions. So we'll be looking to the field to also really inform this action guide, and that'll be one place we'll do that. Katlana? This question is for Delia, but then for anyone else. Um, when your foundation um, grant considering panel is looking at a project, um, in their minds is, if you're thinking of that you fund programs, is that just strictly materials, or is that staff and admin functioning time that goes into that, or do you strictly consider the staff and the, and the other functioning time part of uh, an operating general grant? Well, we, um, the other nice thing I'll just say quickly about our general operating support grants is that we streamlined our application process to make it less onerous for the applicants, and actually we present those by consent to our grant committee and our board. So, so those are um, treated uh, differently. With our program grants, definitely the way that the, um, the, the material is presented is that it can be any related uh, staff costs. So we ask for a program budget, and then to specify which line items or which percentage of line items are you looking to META to support? So that could include staff. It could also include uh, direct program costs, such as transportation, materials, et cetera. And um, we, at this point, we allow 10% um, for indirect. And it's interesting, I received a request from UCSF recently, and I think this is something maybe you all could consider doing as well, where they're asking for the indirect, but they're now also asking for um, another formula line item to support uh, changes in technology. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, this might be an action plan uh, in terms of building philanthropy is that foundations could be providing, asked to provide the indirect as well as uh, another amount, a percentage of the request to support the fund development for the organization. And I hope that answers your question. Yeah, and I think that's a fairly standard thing we've seen, and I, it just it's an important point because many nonprofits undersell themselves and under budget because they're not appropriately factoring their staff costs into their program budgets. So important takeaway there. Yeah, come on up. My name is uh, Jim Johnson, and I'm with Pacific Institute, the Age Song Communities. My question is also for Mrs. Re Ms. Reed. Um, you mentioned that there were four different financial indicators, cash flow and cash, cash on hand, but you didn't mention the other mm -hmm. two. Mm -hmm. And then my other question about it is, well, what about those indicators? What, what exactly are you looking at? Mm -hmm. okay. Well, we do, um, for the organizations that we work with, we do trending financial data, um, so depending upon the length of the relationship. So for some, we'll have maybe seven years of financial data. Um, we really work quite extensively with the audits. And so the financial review, and I'm happy to email it to anybody that is interested, um, it looks at uh, cash on hand, um, the ratio between um, liabilities and assets, mm -hmm. the um, reliance on government support, and I'm actually blanking on the fourth one, I'm sorry, but I can pull it up and look at it. And it's... Um, the, it's an Excel document, so the worksheet feeds into the ratio and then codes them. So we present that information internally to our president when we're um, considering grant requests, and then it also goes to our grant committee and our, um, our full board. And so anytime there is a, a red flag or even um, 
yellow, that gives us another opportunity to have a conversation, an honest conversation with the applicant about, you know, why is that the case? And usually they're able to explain it. And then the way that it works for us is we basically are your advocates when we get in front of our, our board members. And so to the extent that we have that information and we can answer their questions even before they pose them, it um, strengthens our work and again the relationship with the organization. Was your fourth point just about cash flow? Because it was the first one you mentioned before. Mm -hmm. Cash flow. Yeah, days cash on hand. Cash on hand, ratio between liabilities and assets, and then government funding was. Uh -huh. Reliance on government okay, funding. Okay, thank you very much. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? <laughs> it's, well, I mean, the economy is looking a little bit better, so it's, um, it, it's, it's not good to have. Uh, the majority of your reliance on government funding, and also I think it's hard for um, for your your development people. Then they're not forming the relationships with other sources of revenue. They're really just going after those large federal grants. So we see it as a red flag. And, and I can I'll just take two seconds. And that's why when we talked about those bright spot organizations, we looked at organizations that had 25 percent of their overall budget coming from individual gifts. It, speaks a lot to what we're talking about here is that kind of unrestricted cash that they have regularly available to them. Come on up. Good morning, I'm Rochelle France and I'm with the Board of Directors of the Friends of Washington Square, a very underfunded program, <laughs> but we're um, working with the Parks Alliance, thanks to your funding. And my question is, um, given your um, information about the lack of people available in all of your experiences, what universities offer the best programs t for um, this type of uh, career development? And, and actually, I'm going to piggyback on that question, Marla, because I do remember that was a point where I was making a connection between the Daring to Lead study and this one, because I remember in the Daring to Lead, one of the action items there was to grow your own mm -hmm. executive director. Are you landing there with the development director as well? Um, and so you're specifically talking about development director yeah, and programming, and yeah. Personal and, and that, that are programs and universities that you know of right. that have really great programs that you could, you know, uh, yeah. you know, shuttle young people into. Yeah, you know, um, we are excited about, to, to, to Janet's point, um, growing our own, building Ben's strength, and developing people from within the organization to come up the through the organization in, in the role of development, I think is a terrific op, you know, uh, a place to start. Um, one of the things I think we need to do beyond formal education is also the, our, the field needs a PR campaign. You know, there's too many people who just go yuck when they hear about fundraising as a career. I mean, right? And, and it's really a problem. You know, I mean, we need to get it out there that this is a um, you know, values-based, mission-aligned, rewarding position. Um, and not enough people see it that way. When I, when I was doing this study, my mom was even, my mom, I mean, she should totally know better. She was just like, oh, gosh, who would want that job? And I'm like, mom, it's a great job. <laughs> so there's that. Um, and I think part of the way to do that, to Janet's point, is really being able to cultivate through our own organizations. Um, so the other thing is that, you know, there's not enough universities, I would say, that have a focus on phil uh, philanthropy or development. There are a few, um, you know, certainly the Indiana mm -hmm. School. Um, you know, yeah, in, in Indiana. Um, so there, there are a few, and, and um, I, can, I can get you more of them later, and I think a few people in the room could probably rattle them off even better than I. I think the Arnova would be the place that would have a list. Yeah, um, yeah. Don't ask, I forget There's, what it stands for, but they, they're the academic industry research, group right. for, so they would have a list of universities with philanthropy and nonprofit academic programs. And, and many, you know, uh, what I would do is I would look first to, many uh, universities will have a master's and nonprofit, and then I would so I'd, I would first look around to see which ones have a master's in development or philanthropy or fundraising. The name will change, and then also look at nonprofit administration or nonprofit management. Those are those are the, the the words you'll see, and then look inside the master's programs. To what extent do they have a focus, a robust focus? on philanthropy and fundraising. And unfortunately, it's not as many as we think there should be, but they are out there. And I think the other disconnect, too, is that a lot, a lot of them um, emphasize having work experience in the field because the degree alone is not going to land somebody the right job or be uh, create the good fit. So it, uh, 
at the same time that that's part of the solution, I think also making sure that there's yeah. internships yeah. or practicums or some way for yeah. the young people to have, yeah, the mentoring they need. And AFP and, and DER, you know, there's some very strong locally and in other communities too, Ch AFP chapters, Association of Fundraising Professionals, does a lot of work, mentorship programs, a lot of professional development work. Um, the Development Executives Roundtable, similar. Um, so uh, definitely connect with anybody in the profession and they can definitely cue you in right away to some professional development opportunities. Oh, okay. cool. Indiana has a distance learning program too, Troy just said. And I think oh, the, the sorry, fundraising school that started here in San Rafael yeah. and then was adopted by Indiana University is still travels the country doing fantastic uh, week-long seminars on different topics like basics and major gifts and that was, um, that started in the 70s but I think it's still going now and very useful. Hi, I'm Susan Ives. I'm a, a communications consultant to nonprofits. And my question is very basic. It goes back probably an hour and a half to one of the slides that said people have a poor understanding of what fund development is, mm. and that includes me. So I, I guess this question is for Marla, but uh, unless there's lack of consensus, in which case I'd like to hear what other people's ideas are when you talk about fund development. Is it about a specific fund? Is it about development? function in an organization. Um, I'm just unclear about what you mean by that. Yeah, how did you define it for your report? Fund, develop, is, fund development is um, the, the larger um, program and function in an organization that looks to, fundraising is a component of fund development. So fund development is your strategy for your resources. Where are you gonna, what resources uh, are you looking to, to in, to uh, finance your programs and your organization. Um, so cultivation, prospecting, um, the solicitation itself, the fundraising piece, the stewardship, um, uh, the acknowledgement, and I'm thinking about the fund development continuum that many of us have probably seen in many uh, uh, books and those kinds of things. So fund development is all of the pieces together that uh, are, allow your organization to uh, get the resources it needs to do its work from whatever sources that is said pretty plainly, plainly. and then fundraising is an aspect of that. Hi, my name is John Weiss. Uh, I operate a small nonprofit in Bayview Hunters Point. We teach um, uh, at-risk youths how to do uh, technical skills. Uh, currently I'm teaching uh, some youths on probation, uh, how to build boom boxes. Um, uh, some of your panelists have mentioned that um, it's all about relationships. Uh, there was a, a grant uh, uh, offered uh, recently, and um, the grant specified they were seeking innovative programming. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, I feel that what we're doing is extremely innovative. Um, the grant went to well-established organizations who, in my opinion, are not doing anything that's particularly creative or exciting. Um, and I'm wondering if uh, small new organizations, uh, because they don't have that history and that ability to, uh, uh, to they don't have those relationships yet, if, they sh if, if, uh, if we should simply not bother going after uh, uh, those kinds of large grants. Um, Yolanda, I think I'm going to pick on you because as a community foundation, I think you're often the first. You're uh, often the first foundation to fund uh, an organization that previously has only been supported by individual donors. So can you reflect on that a little bit? Because even still, it's still comp very competitive. I'm sure. That's true. So um, yes. So our our grants, um, in spite of our of the numbers I've quoted uh, so far today. Uh, tend to be in, well, have been twenty to thirty thousand. We're now doing more at, at thirty to fifty thousand, but still the majority of them are in the twenty to thirty thousand dollar range. So that makes us really useful only to smaller organizations. And the open responsive cycle allows us to see what those are, what those folks are doing. So um, so it is true, absolutely, that uh, community foundations in general. Um, are a good source for, um, for new organizations. 
and many community foundations uh, sort of stake their claim to fame based on what we call a seeding or, or doing sort of the first original grants to, to smaller or newer organizations to help them become stronger and more sustainable over time. Um, so, so that is true. Um, and I, my personal perspective is that it, that foundations in general will want to match to some extent the investment that they make in an organization based on the track record of, the, of that organization in terms of being able to produce results. So if you want to do a, a $500,000 grant, you're going to look for uh, a larger budget size and a, and a proven track record over time to, to invest those that money than you will for uh, 20,000. We actually do even mini grants that are like $5,000. So, uh, so there's, you know, there's a different level of expectation, different level of due diligence, a different level of everything um, in, in that range. So you might have to scale the foundation support uh, yeah. and start, start small to build to the big grant. Um, Mary, you, you um, oversee a number of family foundations, so any thoughts on this issue of you know, the, the new grantees that get through the door? Well, it's tough because, uh, uh, first of all, it comes down to grant size. So if you're a really small organization, uh, you're not going to go for a, uh, and you have a budget of $100,000, you are not going to go for a $50,000 grant because you don't, because you don't have that's a that's a fairly hefty grant, and so you have to look very carefully at the foundation grant size. But my advice would be: some foundations have, uh, they call them interim grants or staff <coughs> staff designated grants. Those can be smaller grants that the staff and the staff may be more willing to take a risk than the board. But so if there is, a, and it's hard to know where those are, but you, first of all, you'd look for the foundations that, that would fund a program like yours, and then you look deeper into what they actually fund and look at the sizes of the grants. And you might find money around the edges that way that could be helpful. Um, but I think that uh, the other thing is that the, the big foundations with guidelines and application pro, uh, protocols and so forth are the least number of them. Uh, the, the, there are so many out there, and I'm sure you've all done searches where it came up, no proposals, no accepted, no. But you tr treat those people as individual donors. And I think it gets back to the culture of philanthropy within the organization, asking everybody you know, everybody, all the staff, <laughs> do they know people? Because then you're then you're going after those foundations almost more like major gift possibilities. Um, and so that's another, another way in. Um, I'd also look, do what I call backwards fundraising, look at other organizations that are doing somewhat the same as you are and who funds them. That's another way, yeah. And Delia, did you have something to add? Yeah, just quickly, um, as uh, Mary said, looking at other organizations, but also, you know, there's Third Street Youth Center and Clinic that's just opened up in the Bayview. They have a new space, and they're teaching the kids how to do uh, disc jockeying, DJing, and so see if there are other organizations that maybe could, like, incubate you or foster you a little bit, or you could apply for something together. Baycat is another um, great organization that both of those organizations would love hearing about what you're doing, and they might know of some great funding sources either for you, as Mary said, or you could combine on something. And we'll take one more closing question. Greg, come on up, and I'm sorry for the two that didn't get a chance, but maybe you can come up afterward for the meet and greet. Thanks. I'm Greg Lasson. I'm a legacy giving specialist and consultant, and I have a very specific question, but it's really generally applicable, and that is, have any of you seen or heard of any capacity building grants made to nonprofits who are trying to build up what's been traditionally called a plan giving program or a legacy giving program? And specifically within that, if the approach, if you've heard of this, has been more the traditional plan giving technical <laughs> expertise versus the more uh, newer, looking forward looking legacy giving approach, which is more relationship based. Hmm. Anybody see? Well, I can just start up with um, 
w given that the majority of the organizations in many of our grant making areas are much smaller than um, our smaller organizations, um, they are, uh, our experience is that they start with um, the types of funding we were just talking about and with individual donors and getting to the point where you're going to be doing uh, legacy types of, of uh, donor cultivation is, um, is a step beyond where most of our organizations are at. So we, I have not heard that we've done that within the San Francisco Foundation. Not, not to say that it hasn't ever happened, but I haven't heard of it. I, I would say to look at financial institutions and their philanthropic giving, whether they have separate foundations or corporate philanthropy, that would be aligned with that type of work anyway. So look at uh, Fidelity, um, they're giving some of the banks to support that work. The, the, uh, the organizations that we typically fund are, are smaller neighborhood-based organizations and when I think of planned or legacy giving, I think of the big nonprofits mm -hmm. and schools and universities and that kind of thing and I think that most, it, it hasn't really risen in their awareness about the possibilities of, of planned or legacy giving. So maybe that's something that'll come out in the next, in the action plan yeah. Yeah. And as when part of an, an evolionary. Yeah. And when did you say the action guide is due for people who want to continue as exploring long as you this don't topic? Hold me on it and bleep the camera right about now. Um, <laughs> end of fall, I'm hoping. But you know, I mean, I think, Greg, it's such an important question and point because um, I think, I don't know if you would agree with this, I, I feel like there might be a little bit of a misconception that it's only for the large organizations and it's only for organizations mm -hmm, that have mm -hmm. major giving, right? And, uh, you know, I know I've heard from many of you uh, that um, you're more likely to get a uh, legacy gift or a bequest from that donor who gave a hundred bucks for years and years and years than you are going to get from the, the very wealthy major donor that gave, has given you one or two gifts. So, um, for all those foundations out there in the world who are looking for an exit strategy, <laughs> right, for their grantees, what yeah, a terrific true. way to do mm -hmm. that is help set the organization up for um, sustainability through a number of different efforts, and what a great um, uh, strategy to include in that. Just a thought. Thanks, Marla. And thanks to our panel. I'm afraid we are out of time, but please help me in thanking our panelists for their time this morning.